data-based, administrator-centric way of looking at something. Right now, our industry is very developer-centric. And rightly so, because that's where a lot of new things come from. That's where you get the push. But you need balance. What I'm going to try to do is talk about something that's not as tough as much. And that's about controlling your data from the point of view of a DBA. So there is, again, the path. It's in the slides. And this is about technical debt. Now, who here has not heard the expression technical debt? Okay, so there's a, you haven't heard of what a technical debt is, the expression itself, what it's used about? I haven't heard it, but I'm sure that if you describe it, I'll probably go to Oh, no, no. What, <laughs> the thing about giving these talks, you run the gamut across everybody. Right. And it's, it's good to review, and it's also good to introduce. Technical debt is the term when you have an easy fix on a problem that's going to bite you after some time down the road. When you have, and we're going to go through it, part of this slide is going to be basically going through the technical debt, saying this is what it is, as an example. And, you know, I'll throw other examples out of context, not in IT, but other ways of looking at it. Basically, it's overhead. Things get expensive over time when certain decisions are made, and some of those decisions are shortcuts. And those shortcuts, in time, become extremely heavy and painful to accept. And in certain circumstances, they can destroy a business, literally destroy a business. So this is looking at this kind of concept from the point of view of a DBA. Basically, technical debt is when you create the technology, a solution, and something happens in its development, in its implementation, and you come up with a simple way that doesn't exactly follow the rules, but works. In a startup, you're going to have developers hired on. Some of these people are going to be tasked to do all sorts of things. They'll take care of the database. They'll write the code for the server pages. They'll maintain the website. Well, the biggest enemy, the thing that causes technical debt, is succeeding, success. Because success causes growth, it causes scale. And what happens is when you scale, you have division of labor. And at some point, that person who knew that there was a problem with the server page and would skip over to the database to initiate an instruction, he's not going to be there anymore. He's either going to specialize or he's going to move off somewhere else. When a company has technical debt, it maintains itself through what's a fancy term called tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge is somebody who's been in the system for a while. He's not necessarily the smartest, but he's been there so long that he has such a nice personality that people like talk to him and he hears things. New people, if they're smart, they go find this person and they find out what's wrong with their part of the world. They find out these little exceptions, these workarounds, and if they're lucky, they can hear the stories because the stories are the first step to finding out the solution because then you know why things were done a certain way. So if you guys have read your Shakespeare, and I only did it because it was cool, Shakespeare came up in one of his plays, something called The Seven Stages of Life. Well, we just rewrote a little bit. Seven Stages of Stack. There is a life expectancy to a stack. It has a certain way of starting, a certain way of growth, and under the wrong circumstances, a certain way of death. You can't avoid it. It happens. But it is possible to interject, to stop it from happening, or to slow it down by dealing with these issues. And the issue here is dealing with technical death. So taking again from the starting point from the play, all the titles here are basically out of, out of Shakespeare. But let's look at the context. The first stage is basically you You've got a problem. You just don't quite know how to approach it. And the classical solution in the developer environment is the whiteboard. It's blank. There is nothing there. You're just at the starting point. The next step is when you have a collection of technology that you decide you're going to do. Now, the easiest way is to Google. You find out what the industry standard likes. What is the flavor of the year? What technology is there? And it's a good way to start looking at things. Eventually, you become acquainted with the technology. 
you develop an introductory uh, expertise. The stack is starting to be experimented with. Then the next stage comes along. The decisions are made. There is an element of passion because in our technology, we do succeed by pushing ourselves hard. The vision, the passion, the excitement, you know you have an idea of a solution, so you're going to push hard a certain way. You're going to use a certain programming language, you're going to use a certain stack, it's going to evolve a certain way. You're starting to have the ideas. Again, it's, it's still in the formation times. You still have a lot to go, but you've got this general direction. And that's why Agile is so useful, because Agile only goes so far ahead a few steps. The old system, the waterfall system, can't take into account life. There are contingencies, there are issues that happen all the time. One of the biggest decisions that led the industry to move off of C programming was turnover, employee turnover. Initiatives were being made for projects to come together. The C language was free-forming. It allowed people to create anything they want, but then people had their styles. So as the teams moved and they changed and they rotated, new people come along and they wouldn't know where to start. And in some cases, they reinvented the wheel. In some cases, they knew enough of the system that they put in a hack, technical debt, a workaround because they didn't have a complete understanding of the issue. And it allowed the system to continue working. C went to C++. C++ went to Java, etc. You know, there's, there's all sorts of forks of all sorts of languages but they were picked up to solve a problem. And the biggest problem is team orientation. How to get people to work together, how to deal with real world issues. People change, people move on, money comes in, you, the cost of running things goes up. Um, I think you're seeing right now that I'm not talking too much about technical, the technical stuff, but this all affects it. Everything, it's, 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 it's a very big picture thing. You are under, I'm presuming you have that knowledge of Postgres. Because we're going to go into that. We're going to go into the issues. But a DBA isn't hired to do something. They're hired to fix something. They're not the first people hired. They're hired out of desperation. The soldier, the justice. That's when perfection. You push. You know what you're doing. You push. You put in your hard hours. The staff is developing. It is succeeding. It's working. Now that phase, number five, that's basically a mature staff. It works completely, it works well. You have static environment. It's doing what it has to do. But time moves on. You hit number six. What happens isn't that the stack changes. Everything else changes. It scales, it needs to scale. The environment has changed, but the system has not adapted to it. Now, if people thought far enough ahead at the very beginning, they could take into account scaling. Well, sometimes they can't afford to. They can only afford to think so far ahead. The last phase is the obvious one. Everybody is having problems. The cost of maintaining the system is so expensive that it's all they think of. You're no longer spending money to make it better. You're no longer spending money to get money. You're spending money to keep what you got. It's an overhead. So in the beginning, we're using our standard tools, our standard approaches, and there are so many of them. And a lot of us, when we come into an environment, they're already well planned out. And it's great when you're on the ground floor of something because everything is clean. There is no technical debt because there is nothing there. The idea of thinking about it, there's nothing more exciting than brainstorming something out and thinking it out. If you're really good, it shows and you're proud because nothing is there to stop you. That's, that's why developers love the environment. There's three steps to creating a technical solution. One, create the source code. Two, debug the source code. Three, document. Everybody thinks about the first phase. The second phase, they think about it because they've got no choice, because their boss is insisting that the silly thing works. And the third one, nobody gives a hoot because they already know what it does. The problem is, is that we live in a time when everybody has to be able to know what everybody else is doing. If you don't, you will have problems, especially with technical debt. Time is the biggest enemy. As I said, success is your biggest enemy because it forces the environment to change. Eventually, over time, your environment will become unstable. 
you're going to spend a lot more time trying to keep it going than to build on it. If you think of a stack like a house, you think about the furniture, you think about the kitchen, you think about the, 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 the furnishings, all about the expense. It's, you bring in some pretty high priced help. A lot of effort goes in to doing it. But over time, everything deteriorates because you carry on. There is only one place, though, that you can't afford to let carry on. If it's well built, if the foundation is solid, you're okay. But if there is something cataclysmic, or if there was never enough care and concern, it will affect everything. And in this regard, a stack, a stack's foundation is on the database, the data itself. The data has to be translated to information. The information is processed by a database management system. And in this case, I'm talking about Postgres. So when I started my career, my first job was to know the technology to really get to know it well. But as time went on, I started coming into these jobs where they had an existing system and it was mature and it was having problems. And they couldn't quite figure out. Funny thing about a relational database, irrespective of all the competition and all the things that you hear about NoSQL, a relational database, if it's well built, you know how the business makes money. You know where the business is going, and you know how to make it better, because all the logic is well expressed in the database system. Arguably, the first place to fixing something, to fixing a stack, is going to be at the database level, because arguably there, a DBA can see everything. You can see how everything hits in a long chain from the top of the stack all the way bottom. You can see where the delays are. It's a little gaudy, but the, the developers, well, they spend a lot of time learning programming languages, learning approaches, learning paradigms, and then they do it. They're players. Arguably, a DBA doesn't play. He manages the rules. He sets the game. Without clean rules, the developers can't do their work. That's why you'll always see more developers than a DBA, and that's why the average developer doesn't get paid as much as a DBA, because a DBA is more critical. It's an unsexy job, but it is extremely critical. They are the first to be looked at, they are the last to be thought of. A successful project will always, always get kudos on the top of the stack. But the success of the business, if there's problems, they look at the bottom first, and that's the DBA. So in a nutshell, let's run the assumption. You have a stack, you have a business, you walk in, you're a consultant. Well, this approach is basically common sense. It is literally so common sense, you could use these rules in any context. So much so that I'm going to give you a quote on an expression from a long time ago, several thousand years ago. There is nothing new under the sun. Literally, you come up with an idea, an approach to resolve, it's gold. It doesn't matter. Times change, fashion change, it doesn't matter. The human condition is still there. So the first thing to do is to figure out what's going on. Once you understand, yes, you streamline. You simplify the environment where possible. It's not just the operations, it's understanding what's going on. It's actionable. You see something, but only look at things that need a decision based on. Inform and document. Again, I said there are three steps to development. There's the coding, there's the debugging, and there's the documenting. The documenting is extremely important, and in large, well-established environments, they spend a lot of money on JIRA, on Confluence. Those documents increase the IP value of that company, and they also make it possible to know what's going on, for other people to know what they're doing. So when you go and then you're going to figure out what's on, now we're going to start about the regular stuff. Okay, you're going to monitor the system. You know, this is a bit like a checklist when you go get your vehicle inspection, you get the little squares, you just check them off. You could use that sheet 
and basically fit this right into to, to what you need to do for the database and technical debt. It would, fit, it would make sense. Develop metrics, everybody understands. We're talking about vocabulary. We're talking about things that developers see and do all the time. Correct bottlenecks to critical issues. That means you have to understand how the business works, how the flow works. A database system, a stack, is a dynamic creature. It's never the same at different times of the day, different days of the week, different months of the year. It's always moving. Appreciate that. Performance tuning, that's a tricky thing. Performance sometimes is uh, a misleader. If you have a stable environment, nothing is broken, you want to make it faster, you want to look for anomalies. But that's not today's tendency. Right now, every company has been told they are now an internet company. Every company in traditional business are told you have to have IT. That means they're transitioning. Performance tuning is a stable environment. Nothing changes. You can look at things, you can say, okay, let's start dealing with issues. My peers, I have worked with old school DBAs, and they do a lot on performance tuning. They're in stable environments. But every time I go into something, there's always been some sort of explosion. Performance tuning is a last minute thing. It's no longer something that you do on your own. If there is performance enhancement, it has to be related to the process of creating the technology. So monitoring the system. Now it's time to have an opinion, and you may have noticed I've got a few of them. Open source and commercial. In the United States, medium to large size companies, they've gone past this transition of saying, we should use open source technology monitoring versus commercial. They have no problems putting down tens of thousands of dollars of monitoring a system that is originally open source and is acquired by free download. No problem at all. Canada, that's another situation. There's a, a delay. Um, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I can get away saying it. There's a retardation of realizing that something that's free doesn't mean you should use only free tools to figure out what's going on. You spend money to figure out what's going on. It's cost-benefit. So there's a lot of choices, and they're all out there. It's not just the database system, it's the operating system, it's the network. And when in doubt, Google is your friend. It's a great way of finding out what the trends are, what the tools are. Every environment that I've walked into, they keep seem to have a different monitoring system. Like not just a Nagios or a skin of Nagios, they have whole different technologies out there. It's not the same. It's not practical to specialize. All you have to, the only thing you can do is just learn the very basics that those technologies base themselves on. Um, here's a quick question. This is a commercial item. Has anybody ever heard of extra hop? Okay, high price hardware technology. It's really cool, it's got an interface. It can see the packets going across a network and it can reverse engineer them. You can actually see queries in real time. And it works and it will graph ten trends and you can query it like a database. It's very, very cool. I'm not talking about go buy it. I'm saying solutions out there commercially are already out there. It's not about telling your guys, paying them, and then having them use free stuff to figure it out. Their efforts, the human component, a DBA, is worth more than the hardware. And I would suggest that a DBA is dollar for dollar worth more than a developer because there's only one of him, because developers right now, if you look at the criticisms online, developers are, are, are hired as for, to fill in seats. This is being nasty, it's being critical. It's, what I'm trying to say is a DBA is an underappreciated position because it's an unsexy position until something breaks. Okay. Robert. Yes. Uh, I found, like, we, we tried several different monitoring tools. Uh, we found that uh, the ones that are more network based, they'll say they can monitor certain uh, types of databases and they get hit and miss in how the quality is. But if you do go to a very specific uh, uh, database,
have this monitoring tool available right down to, to uh, right in detail database issues. Yeah. Right. So uh, sometimes you have to if you want the information. Or the it's it, it's an open wide yeah. It's open wide. Uh, the message for this slide is is there's so much out there available. Don't limit yourself yeah. with with opinions. Don't limit yourself to basic open source tools. Don't limit yourself to commercial tools. The prejudice will kill you. Uh, Postgres itself. Okay, chapter 28. This is the current versions of Postgres. If you go online, this is the traditional page for monitoring. This whole chapter, this page, this first entry page, lists all the basic techniques. There's two kinds. One is your normal Linux tools, and it just goes over a few examples. And then there's the sophisticated statistical views that are present in Postgres. Postgres is different from Oracle and different from SQL Server for one key reason. Oracle and Microsoft create ecosystems, entire environments that complement and support database management systems. Postgres is literally freewheeling. You can create anything you want as sophisticated as you want. But if you don't follow a set standard, it's going to be confusing as all hell. Okay. Last part, log analysis. Um, open source and commercial. PG Badger. It's an available open source tool. It reads log files. Splunk can digest log files and you can use it. The nice thing about Splunk is you can standardize an entire department on how to use that. PG Badger is a specialized tool. It's good for the, the DBA, but that DBA or the team will have to go a little step farther to educate people outside of that group to take advantage of it. Splunk is used in every domain, in marketing decisions, in management decisions, not just in operations or development decisions. So that's an easy way for people to learn to use that. So again, different cost benefits. It's, it's, it's open to you to decide. So again, here's an example, and uh, this uh, it's a snapshot from the Postgres uh, document page using PS. Now there are three qualities that I would say defines a Postgres DBA. One, he is a DBA. He knows his engine backwards and forwards. Remember what I said, there is nothing new under the sun. Everything I'm saying, everybody intuitively already knows. Second, because Postgres is not supported by an ecosystem, the implicit ecosystem is the OS. You need to know Linux. You need to know how the funny thing works. You need to understand the kernel. Now that's an ideal. There are concepts in the operating system that help. Things like file handles. Things like uh, the kernel parameters, the runtime parameters for semaphores. These are concepts. Some of them are, are put in the documentation, but they lead. They lead into the OS itself. You buy Oracle, you're buying their expertise, and you're buying their decision making. They're already handling these environments. Here, you're given the opportunity to learn about it and deal with it yourself. Monitoring the database activity, again, it's quite extensive. These, these links in the documentation, they go into hundreds of views and tables to view what's going on in the database system. Technical debt is anomalous behavior. You can see it here. Not just the standard tools, but in Postgres itself. Again, this is an underappreciated system outside of the realm of the database. This is an example of uh, Check MK monitoring. Again, I'm not suggesting that you use this solution. It is a way to monitor. There's a reason why DBAs get assigned into operations department, traditional operations department. It's because they know the operating system, they know the network. You see patterns. The tools to pick up on problems are normally tied into that. Typically, they'll use a, a bash script to connect into the database, pull, uh, execute a query and pull out the results, and then pump it into this. There's, there's always a little bit of documentation in these uh, Nagios types environments to get the trends defined. A lot of vendor solutions, they already have that figured out. Enterprise DB a few years ago, um, they put out a monitoring device that actually had all the hooks, all the queries, all the analysis for Postgres. You just bought the silly thing for $5,000.
and then you get yearly of licenses, and it would work like that. It would have an agent on the server, the, the agent would do its analysis and send the results to the central server. So you'd see all these alerts, and you could define it and tune it. The nice thing about that is you don't have an education in trying to figure out what's important. The education is, is understanding the significance of what you see. Developing a metric, especially with Postgres, is very open. Again, it, it's, it's a standard issue. It's, there's not enough said about it. There's a reason why there's less documentation on Postgres online or in books than in most other technologies. That's because the people who know what they're doing, they're busy earning a living. An ecosystem normally has some sort of publishing arm that creates the books. There's not that much said. So to find out, you have to figure out, go through Google, go through the, 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 the Postgres mail list, go on the IRC channels. Uh, there's a lot of old school techniques. Find out what the implication is. For example, is a service up and running? Well, it's kind of obvious. If she's down, you're going to see an alert. It's going to come on. Uh, system slowing down, that's a trend. Depending on your monitoring system, if you can watch the trends, you can alarm the trend, not just the absolute numbers. I.O. too high, too low. I have walked into environments where I.O.s were extremely high, but it was okay because they were on real machine doing high analytics. I walk into other environments and I see the I.O. at 10% of that and people are, are, are pulling hair out of their heads because they figure it's way off. It's, it's a very relative thing. And you only find out the significance by studying the pattern of the environment. Uh, transactions. Connections. A lot of people, developers, when they create technology and then they move on, they sort of express an act of faith. People will use the default configuration values in Postgres. Well, those values aren't there to make it work well. The Postgres community defines those values as the minimum threshold to work on any contemporary hardware right now. That's it. So I've walked in and I see alerts of all the connections being saturated. That's because it's left at 150. So I go in and I change it to 3,000. And they didn't realize that the system was built to take that. Uh, number of errors. Backups, DDLs, DDLs is a crazy thing. In a, a, an environment, you're going to push code all the time. You're always going to push changes, okay? One of the big things that happens when you create a table is that if you alter it, add a column, take away a column, change that attribute, whatever, it's going to lock the table. It's going to stop it, anything from, from working on it. Now that's okay when the system is lower scale, when it's not as active, when it's quiet. But when it becomes more active and you lock the table, it causes production issues. And by that time, you've got habit, you've got tradition. People don't think about it. You have to look at it with fresh eyes. Rule of thumb, one does not update or change a database by adding or taking away columns. One does it by adding or removing rows. If you try to change intrinsic behavior, design your system that way. That you put properties where you put in rows or take out rows. That's what a database system is for. When it's row-wise designed. Postgres, by default, is row-wise. If you have a table and you've got columns, you change one column and it affects the entire row. So instead of doing a column, you do something with the row. Now there are ways around it. You can have a column-wise configuration. That means either using a different database system or using one of the extensions that do exist and is available for Postgres that will create a table that is column-wise. Does everybody know, like, please be aggressive. Is there, do you know what the difference is between a column-wise and a row-wise? Does anybody not know? Okay. Open up a spreadsheet. You write down numbers across the, the row and the numbers are added or they're changed. You don't change them one cell at a time, you change the entire row at a time, and then you press your enter. That's row-wise. But when you start doing queries, queries don't make decisions based on the rows. They make decisions on the where criteria based on the columns. Now what happens if you put values on individual columns? 
Well, for analytics purposes, that makes the system really fast. That's why NoSQL is, is, is popular, because that allows them to do high power queries. The problem is, is that it gets slower when you put in and take out information. It's fast when you figure things out. That's, that's the puzzle when you use traditional row-wise and column-wise. And the experts, they know it. There's nothing new under the sun, so they, there are all these established solutions. It's an act of faith on your part. If you don't know about it, take it as an act of faith. This has been covered. There are solutions about these things. There are discussions about these issues. Um, report generations. OLAP versus OLTP. OLTP is the rapid, putting in and taking out of information really fast. OLAP, report generations. I have walked into environments where report generations were started 36 hours before in a transaction. It worked fine when the system was 10 times smaller. I remember this one time. I was looking at a system. There was an intuit, a feeling of how the information was being processed. It looked like the transaction would start, and then there are these statements. They were constantly being put in all the time, all the time, all the time. But at about 24 hours, then things would blow up. So it looked like there was some sort of a loop going on. The loop was the transaction was open, do all the processing, and when all the processing was done, commit. So I sat down with the key developer, the architect, and I told him, this is what I felt was going on. Now this guy had been around for seven years, which in the industry, they, they look down on people who stay more than two years at a company. Um, he was happy. It felt familiar. We were going to start working in another meeting, and in 20 seconds, we solved this one. He opened up the repo, the source code. He identified the loop. And the fix was just changing the Python code. Instead of committing at the end of the transactions, every statement was automatically committed. That solved the bottleneck right there. We had no more locking. So locking is an issue because of asset compliance. You want to retain the validity, the validity of data. That's where the problems come up. Should you scale? How do you scale? How do you perform disaster recovery? Other questions like these issues. OK. Correcting bottlenecks to issues. Query tuning. Um, in the stats, in Postgres, you can see whether or not the indexes are being used. You can see if tables are being hit. If the tables are being hit and the indexes are, are not being used, then you've got yourself a puzzle. Why is that happening? Is it because there's no index on the column? Is it because there's not enough memory assigned to that index in RAM so that it can be used? When a query in Postgres is executed, there's actually a three-step process. One, it comes up and tries to translate whatever the query is in a common language. It's a mathematical language. Two, it goes into the database and looks for statistics that match patterns. It figures the order of what tables to look at first. And then three, it executes. If you do something like a prepared statement, and if you have the only thing that changes is the value, the actual query states the same, you've skipped, you've gone past those two statements. So if you run this query several thousand times, only the first two stages get executed once. After that, it's just the third step. So there's another performance step. It's another way of making things faster. Um, housekeeping activities, vacuuming, multi-version concurrency control. It is an old technology. It is an old way of doing something. At the dawn of relational databases, there were three primary methods of how to protect data when a table was being queried. One of them was creating a snapshot, multi-version concurrency control. Postgres adopted that technique. There's a problem with it. If you delete something, you get what's called a dead tuple. It's still in the file, it's still in the database, but it's been marked as, don't bother reading it. There has to be housekeeping activities to pick up and clean up. So, if you don't tune it correctly, 
it, the table gets larger and larger, and the performance gets slower and slower. Sometimes technical debt is when people set up the system and the statistics go out of date, they run, they use a cron job, they'll run vacuums. And current standards, current industry recommendation is vacuums should be run continuously, auto vacuum. And if not, you should at least have a vacuum of a constantly changing churning system once every 24 hours. Well, this vacuum statement works great on 10 gigabyte tables, but what happens when the 10 gigabytes goes to 100 or 200 or 300? When you start with a 100 gigabyte database and you end up with a 5 terabyte system, the overhead becomes awesome because it takes time for these statistics to get updated. Well, wouldn't you, by running your, um, you know, like doing your analysis every month or something like that, you start setting a trend up in, the, in front of I.O. and, yeah. and uh, re, you know, even write times and, and the size of the, uh, the tables. Yeah. So hopefully that would give you an indication that you need to start looking at maybe making changes. Yeah. And there's an assumption that you have the bandwidth. Yeah, true, true. Remember, in this environment that I'm talking about, we start with developers. Developers are creating solutions. The solution works. The system scales. Technical debt is when the solution, the workarounds that are used, start adding costs. And they may not be in a position to deal with it. When I came into situations, there were situations where I couldn't even deal with the vacuuming issue because there were other higher priorities. Operations is known as a reactionary environment. And that means it's the the squeakiest wheel that, that gets addressed first. If you push uh, an issue, it has to affect other people. So you have to make that argument. Yeah, what you're saying makes perfect sense. Right, yeah, yeah. Right, bandwidth is, is would be a problem. Yeah. So there are issues. When you run a full vacuum, it's a dedicated process. And it will suck CPU and it'll suck I.O. And the popularity in certain quarters of industry right now is they are moving away from machines. They are at the intermediate stage, is they have a machine, and they have a NAS. They have a SAN. It is a remote, detached data store. You're one step away from going into the cloud, which is the, the way the industry is going. It's in full tilt mode in the United States. In Canada, they're about one or two steps before that, but uh, we're, we're seeing it coming. But the fact is, is that if you have detached, then I.O. becomes a huge issue. Bigger, bigger than it was uh, than when machines are standalone. Because machines themselves, they're stable. Hardware is stable. Sure, the I.O. will go up, but it lives with it. But when you go detached, now you're talking about sharing stresses, sharing environments. And you're talking about other people in the department, in, the, in your team, that is looking at the NAS, looking at vSphere, looking at the overall I.O.s. And all these issues, they start adding up. Examples of controlling your data from the Postgres way of doing things. Uh, explain. Vacuum, PG Repack. PG Repack is an external project. There is something called float. There are certain activities in Postgres where the table will continue to expand and cannot be read and cannot be vacuumed properly. The fancy word, it's an old word, defrag. You defrag that table. PG Repack does that. It's an interesting technology because it allows you to fix the system under production conditions. Otherwise, you need to do something like vacuum full. Or, again, technical debt. In the old days, the developers would just do a dump and restore because they didn't know any better and it was just an extra little bit of work to do. But the system has now grown to the point that that is a major issue and it's affecting your customers, affecting SLAs. It's affecting the bottom line because you can't guarantee things. Google Cloud. Has everybody heard about Google Cloud? Three nines are what they guarantee. Three nines was the industry standard in 1995. That's all Google is willing to guarantee on their system right now because it's evolving, it's changing so fast. 
And they're so powerful, we can make you live with them. Kubernetes, Docker, has everybody heard about that? You put Docker environment into the cloud, Google has a three version warning. They say that they will always update their Kubernetes, which means that your entire Docker system will go down. It'll be down for a few seconds, and then it'll come up again. If you do not update your Docker environment within three versions, your system will no longer be compatible with Google and will no longer work. You are forced to follow their upgrade schedule. Technical debt. So, Streamlight, again, there's nothing new here. You just have to be aware. Look at the system. If you come into an environment, things break, find out what's going on, monitor the system, and then remediate. Well, remediate is a life cycle approach. See, decide, act. See, decide, act. It goes over and over and over. Sometimes money makes an effect, sometimes it doesn't. It's a judgment call. It's, it, it, it depends on the circumstance. Sometimes all, all it is is just having, giving your people or you enough time to sit down and looking at something. Sometimes it's about just convincing somebody to spend $20,000 for that monitoring tool that saves you a month worth of work of figuring something out. Yes? You often throw money at it to save time or, or give us longer time on technical debt. Yeah. Documentation. A successful DBA can't live by himself. He can't live on his own. What he has is very critical knowledge. It's knowledge that the DBAs, uh, that the developers need. We have this thing called DevOps. We have Google has this thing called Site Reliability Engineer. Well, certain orders of management somewhere in the industry, we say, oh, great way to save money, eliminate operations. Of course, it's not the right way of looking at it. The idea behind it is that people who create something, they know it best, they can care for it best. The fact is, is that people don't have enough time in the day to learn everything they need to know. So you help them learn the critical issues. As a DBA, I have worked with deaf developers and again, you know, there's two kinds of DBAs, working in stable environments and working in ever-changing environments. Ever-changing environments, you're always dealing with the system itself. Stable environments, you actually work with queries. I have seen the most magnificent queries and coding come out of developers. Really, really fantastic stuff. But they don't understand the context. In of itself, it works fine. But in a dynamic environment, there could be times when that query won't work well. You have to educate them. It's, sometimes it's 20 seconds. They have to know. And that's what the documentation is about. Sometimes they don't ask until you start seeing issues. Yeah. That's why we have these famous lunch and learns. Does everybody, who has never heard of lunch and learn? Lunch and learn. When somebody comes up, the office supplies pizza, sushi. I tell you, I have a weight problem. In that. It's the lunch and learn. That's, that's where the problem is. <laughs> it's a good way of sending a message, saying, hey, guys, here's something that can be useful. Sometimes all it is is just a few seconds. Um, empowering. That's what we're leading up about. Dealing with technical debt isn't a one-man show. It's not even a DBA show. It's about the developers who in our industry are being asked to follow the entire life cycle of their system. Um, in certain cores of industry, they say there are silos. That means there are departments that just work on one thing. When they get that thing done, they pass it on, and they don't worry about it. And if they hear anything about what they work, there's an entire process of communicating. A DevOps eliminates that process of communicating. They're staying there all the time. On call. On-call is something that developers have never done. DevOps are being educated. They are going to have to wake up at 2 in the morning to find out why the system is broken. And if they know enough, they can solve a problem within seconds, or they can see a problem coming up. That's why we have this need to share the information. 
Yeah. One of the things we used to do is that whenever we did a uh, major upgrade, whether it was um, you know, going to the release of either a database or the operating system or something like that, the first customer, we called it a uh, FOA, first application offering, um, and or VO, verification offering. And um, we would have the engineer, primary engineer that, that did the development work, whatever it was. Yeah. For the VO, they had to be on call just to make sure that if we ran into problems, uh, they were there 24/7 while we were doing the upgrade. Just like just like the guys that were actually doing it. So, yeah. um, I've been in environments when there was an on-call incident. Yeah. There was the people who could fix the problem, the managers who were in charge of the people who could fix the problem, the knock who were the ones that were charged with alerting the people in, who could fix the problem, and then a single supervisor who actually was over all of this group. And they all had to be online within 10 minutes. Now that was when I was working at Assurian. And for anybody who doesn't, isn't familiar with that term, Assurian is the insurance company that insures every cell phone on the planet. And, uh, we, did, we did something very similar. Okay, so, nothing new under the sun. Postgres had a central site. There are wonderful blogs that people write, not just on the site, but elsewhere on the, uh, on the internet, but centralizing the information. Um, right here, under documentation and community, these are key links right here. The mailing lists, that's important there. RNRC I don't use as much, now this is actually new, Slack. That is relatively new. And uh, that, that, that's very impressive that to be able to get the Slack channel. But then Slack has had a very, very good impression on everybody. And it's amazing that Google is so far behind them. Um, again, the community, the documentation, very important, very useful. This is your standard documentation. The bottom right, that is arguably the most important section of the Postgres documentation. Section 6, part 1, 2, and 3. Everything else colors the background, but every day, section 6, part 1, the SQL commands. 2 and 3, the utilities that you need to sign up your services. Very, very important, very useful. This is what needs to be communicated out all the time. When you write a ticket, when you write an email, especially with technical debt, documentation is about references. Sometimes your opinion doesn't mean that much. So you put down something and says, this is where, this is where you can test it. This is where you can see things. And at the end of the day, have a good time. Enjoy yourself, because you are going to be in a high-stress environment. And just enjoy what you do. Go on a fishing trip. Catch a dolphin. I got that slide years ago. I've never, never stopped using it. <laughs> okay, again, there's the references. You find that also on the on the, uh, the web page. Uh, questions? Uh, please tell me I did a decent job. I gave you something that at least was useful. <laughs> Any questions then? Comments? All right. Enjoy the rest of the day.